History and Southern Studies uh, here at the University of Mississippi. And it is certainly my honor and pleasure to introduce um, Dr. James C. Cobb. Um, Dr. Cobb is Fitzney Spalding Professor Emeritus at the University of Georgia. He's a former president of the Southern Historical Association. He's, he's written wild, widely and wildly. <laughs> on the uh, history, uh, the cultures, and the politics of the American South. His, his books are numerous, but include uh, The Selling of the South, uh, The Most Southern Place on Earth, as well as The Way Down South, The History of Southern Identity, and The South in America Since World War II. Uh, today's talk comes from, of course, his most recent book, C. Van Woodward, America's Historian, published just last month by the University of North Carolina Press. Uh, please join me in welcoming, if I may borrow from the parlance of UGA, our alma mater, a damn good dog, Dr. James Seacott. journey is a lot more than that, but it, it certainly is a similar journey. I was, I was telling there today, the, the first, when I came here on my job interview, uh, uh, the, the first thing that happened uh, uh, was uh, that we went to a poetry reading at the original Square Books over there. It was John Cruz from the uh, English department. I remember that. I thought, God, these people are cool. <laughs> I was living in Iowa, you know, they didn't have that. Torture, <laughs> maybe. Ah, no way. So uh, I thought, uh, God, I hope this, I get this job. And, uh, and it, it took them a while, but they, they finally did, you know, didn't have any better sense than to offer it to me. And, uh, and we, uh, you know, we were very much blessed by the chance to be here for as long as we were. Uh, I'm going to just try to... Uh, uh, you know, kind of lift a few things out of the text for you and, and, and sort of do a, an overview and, and then dip into a few little examples that I think you might be interested in or entertained by. And uh, I hopefully we'll have lots of time left for um, questions. Comber Van Woodward was scarcely the only 20, 20th century American historian who enriched or expanded our understanding of key aspects of the nation's past. Yet we would be hard pressed indeed to find any among them, or for that matter, among the scholars of any disciplinary school, <coughs> who earned such deference and respect within the academic sphere while achieving such prominence outside it, much less maintain both for nearly so long. Nor did Woodward acquire or retain his lofty stature as either a professional historian or as a public intellectual by steering clear of crises and controversies. A tireless advocate for social justice from his 20s until his 90s, he compiled an astonishing record of direct involvement in crusading for racial integration, defending civil liberties and academic freedom, and combating abuses of power in the highest echelons of government. In this, he revealed a personal commitment to changing the present, that his writings about the past often seem calculated to inspire in others. Such an expansive record of social and intellectual achievement seemed improbable, to say the least, for someone born in rural Arkansas during the first decade of the 20th century, raised in its clan-infested communities and educated in its public schools. Nor did his two years at a tiny Arkansas Methodist college, followed by two years at Emory, University, then still very much the domain of the uber-rich and uber-Methodist Candler family, seemed likely to inspire much in the way of creating 
creative thinking or reformist zeal. But then if his most famous book was aptly titled as The Strange Career of Jim Crow, my own humble offering about its author might just as well be dubbed The Strange Career of C. Van Wood. For his was a story rich in unexpected twists, abrupt turns, and truly ironic outcomes. Perhaps the most surprising of these was that he became a historian in the first place. His brief exposure to the discipline at Emory had persuaded him that he wanted no part of it as a <laughs> profession. His overriding passion was literature at that point, and so it remained even after he grudgingly enrolled in the History PhD program at the University of North Carolina in 1934, solely as a means of securing the funding he needed to complete his biography of Georgia populist firebrand Tom Watson. To his great dismay, instead of the kind of curiosity and creativity then rocking the Southern literary scene, with but few exceptions, his UNC professors seem to think that preparing graduate students in Southern history amounted to little more than catechizing them in the accumulated wisdom of their elders, as found in musty old volumes written at least a generation earlier and left to languish wholly unrevised in the interim. Plotting through the likes of these, Woodward wondered if he had ever encountered prose so pedestrian, pages so dull, chapters so void of ideas, whole volumes so wrong-headed or so lacking in point. Persuaded that becoming a professional historian promised little more than a lifetime dedicated to inflicting such reading on innocent youth, <laughs> not to mention himself, he recalls spending many a night during his first semester pacing Chapel Hill's legendary Franklin Street, debating whether I might fare better as a fruit peddler, panhandler, or hat writer. Woodward declared at the end of his first year at Chapel Hill that he had not gleaned a single scholarly idea from professors concerned only with ensuring his command of the fundamental facts. History, I find, is a collection of facts, he complained to a friend uh, from his Emory days. Should have looked into that before going so far. Nothing but contempt for facts. Opinion, all that matters. Proper attitude. <coughs> These sentiments were not offered with tongue entirely in cheek. <coughs> Even while Citizen, who was Woodward's best friend, Even while Citizen, who was Woodward's best friend in graduate school, admitted that his chum had little zeal for mastering the bricks and mortar of historical information. Bennett Wall, another grad school colleague, agreed that Woodward was a great ideas person, but never a nuts and bolts man. Focused solely on completing his book, he had cut classes with abandon and dashed off assignments right before class. But with his formal PhD orals bearing down on him in the spring of 1936, he had no choice but to frantically beg and wheedle notes from his classmates at the last possible minute in hopes, as one of them put it, of learning just enough to pass those examinations. By all accounts, among Woodward's faculty examiners, the only one who felt he had met even that minimum standard was his brand new dissertation advisor, Howard Beal, who after earnestly pleading his case for more than an hour, managed to browbeat his colleagues into agreeing to the barest of bare passes. Even so, Woodward seemed neither embarrassed nor humble by his sorry showing when he claimed the day after the exam to be indulging myself in the dubious pleasure of some extravagant forgetting. No niggardly date here and a dictator there, but whole dynasties at a time. Poof, there go the Habsburgs. Poof, the Hohenzoll. I made the mistake of forgetting the Hanoverians before the oral. A continent or two, an ocean of diplomacy and a library of books. Alcohol provides an excellent solvent for the unused impedimenta of information after examination. In the end, though, Woodward's absolute obsession with completing his Tom Watson biography paid off in a dissertation that was submitted to Macmillan in May 1937 and published less than a year later with scarcely a trace of revision. Despite the generally favorable response to Tom Watson, agrarian rebel in academic circles, however, 
His indifferently acquired PhD in history remained largely an afterthought until the book's first year sales of only 559 copies finally forced him to acknowledge that it is from my teaching and not my writing that I am going to have to make my living. With that, the stage was set for arguably the most pivotal of all the timely and fortuitous twists that would become the hallmark of his long career. Eager to beef up his scholarly creds, he pounced on an invitation in March 1939 to write volume nine of the New History of the South series encompassing the period 1877-1913, which he saw as more important professionally than anything I could write just now. I went to the onset of World War II and <coughs> other days, excuse me, the later, the volume would not appear until 1951, though it would soon prove itself worth the wait. The research effort behind Origins of the New South was massive enough to produce a second book, Reunion and Reaction, a boldly revisionist take on the Compromise of 1877, which ostensibly brought down the curtain on Reconstruction. Yet it was Origins, a commanding synthesis of a little explored period that savaged the dominant, thoroughly whitewashed New South historical account of that era that would quickly establish its author as the leading authority on Southern history since the Civil War. <coughs> Meanwhile, and yet another staggering improbability, the book that would fuel Woodward's meteoric ascent to prominence outside the Academy grew out of three hastily conceived lectures that he delivered at the University of Virginia in September 1954, scarcely four months after the Supreme Court's landmark school desegregation ruling in Brown versus Board of Education. The lectures were rushed into print, essentially verbatim, by Oxford University Press in April 1955 as the strange career of Jim Crow. Looking primarily to rally active support for enforcing the Brown Decree, Woodward took issue with the seemingly indelible conviction, even among those who welcomed the ruling, that rigidly defined racial separation had been an elemental fixture in Southern life far too long to be eradicated by a mere Supreme Court decree. Contending that consistent, rigidly observed segregation actually dated back little more than 50 years to the so-called Jim Crow statutes of the 1890s, he encouraged readers to believe that as a creation of law in its own right, and a fairly recent one at that, the practice could surely be eliminated by the same name. His thinking, Woodward later explained, was it that if he could persuade reluctant would-be activists that racial segregation in the South originated not in ancient habit or custom, but in a legal framework dating back scarcely half a century, they might take hope that segregation was not all that invulnerable. Contrary to what remains a pervasive legend, although Dr. <coughs> Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. made note of the strange career of Jim Crow in the speech he delivered in Montgomery at the end of his story march from Selma in March 1965, he did not, in fact, anoint it as the Bible of the Civil Rights Movement on that occasion. More is the pity for the book's author, who was in the crowd that day, had seen it providing just the sort of inspiration such a designation would have implied. Meanwhile, though it would go on to become the most widely read book on the history of American race relations published in the 20th century, as a piece of scholarship, <coughs> the strange career of Jim Crow amounted, in many respects, to an epic fail. Not only did its sweeping attack on the traditional assumptions about the origins of segregation rest upon only eight quoted sources, but Woodward had cherry-picked these sources with such surgical precision that the words he shared with his readers were as often as not contradicted by others not only within the same paragraph, but even in adjoining sentences. The scant support he could marshal for his central argument was soon so overwhelmed by contradictory evidence uncovered by other historians that by 1970, David Hackett Fisher showed no hesitation in declaring that it had already been proven wrong in all its major parts. Regardless of whether they bought Woodward's argument, however, a great many Americans bought his book, which would appear in successive editions bringing the crusade against segregation up to date in 1957, 1966, and 1974. It would go on to sell over a million copies 
simply because it offered the best and for quite some time the only brief overall narrative, if not of the origins of Jim Crow perhaps, then certainly of his rise, dominion, and demise at a time when it could hardly have been more relevant. Well into the 20th century, Southerners writing about their region's past and any genre were expected to heed tightly to the tenets of a highly orthodox historical creed aimed at rationalizing the South's current racial, <coughs> political, and economic system as the most logical and feasible extension of strategies devised to help it overcome the destitution and havoc brought by the Civil War and Reconstruction. Between 1938 and 1955, Woodward had challenged this narrative and the sense of legitimacy it conveyed on the present order in four books, which as historian Richard King observed with little exaggeration, collectively revolutionized the established views of Southern history from the end of the Civil War to World War I. This was no small achievement for someone who had once steadfastly rejected even the notion of becoming a historian. Yet in another striking tradition, <clears throat> at age 46, with nearly half his life and two-thirds of what proved to be an exceptionally long and productive career before him, the scholar who had recently come into his own as the reigning eminence in his field had published his last book-length originally researched work of history. There would be an aborted attempt to write a book on Reconstruction and a handful of articles for major professional journal journals over the next 40 years. But only one of these gave evidence of relying on research conducted after 1951. Going forward, Woodward's written contributions as a historian, arguably some, arguably some of the greatest he could render, were to come elsewhere in scores of essays, commentaries, and opinion pieces appearing in widely read publications ranging from the New York Times, the New York Review of Books, the Harper's Newsweek, and Times. A number of these would resurface in published collections of his writings, the best known being the enormously engaging burden of Southern history, where he deftly explored the nature of both Southern and national identity and the vital importance of each to the other. Though never hesitant to address the South's historic wrongs and enduring flaws, as the essays in this convention collection revealed, Woodward maintained a powerful and unapologetic emotional attachment to his downtrodden native region and frequently reminded its self-righteous northern critics that their own backyards could use a bit of work as well. Despite its title, the burden of southern history offered as many lessons for Americans outside the South as within, including his precocious warnings about the inherently dangerous presumptions of national innocence and invincibility that sustained the mythology of American exceptionalism. These warnings were borne out repeatedly as the nation endured the tragedy and folly of intervention and escalation in Vietnam, the explosion of wanton violence and rage in its central cities, and the humiliation and disillusionment of the Watergate scandal. A comprehensive tally of Woodward's writing aimed at readers outside the traditional academic realm would offer a veritable laundry list of the critical national and international issues that concerned Americans in general at one point or another over the greater part of his 91 years. One might have predicted that at some point his growing popular appeal would even undermine his lofty standing among his academic colleagues or, as it seemed to do with his friend Arthur Schlesinger Jr., encourage Woodward to abandon that calling altogether. Yet, if anything, the effect was just the opposite. After securing a position at Johns Hopkins immediately after World War II, he had politely resisted the advances of a formidable procession of ardent academic suitors hmm. before Yale came calling with the author, offer of a prestigious Sterling professorship in 1960. Between Hopkins and Yale, he would direct more than 40 PhD dissertations to completion. Among their authors were three future Pulitzer laureates, not to mention many more who garnered other prestigious awards to numerous to cite. Others have directed more dissertations, certainly, but no American historian has managed over a three decade span to attract and train a collection of graduate students who, as a group, registered a more substantial impact on their field. 
His habitual generosity in reading and commenting on the work of others at various stages in their careers makes it even more difficult to exaggerate Woodward's importance to scholarship in American history during the last half of the 20th century. His meticulous evaluations of the work of friends and colleagues bespoke a singular dedication to a task that consumed huge chunks of his own writing time and often left his patients sorely taxed. Such was surely the case with the text of Ole Miss historian James W. Silver's searing expose, Mississippi, the Closed Society, which he had received from Silver in late September 1963, scarcely a week before it was due to the publisher. <laughs> he praised Silver's courage in offering such a terrible <laughs> and impressive indictment of the mindset of white Mississippi, but he fairly pleaded with him not to publish this draft without extensive revision, reorganize, reorganizing, and rewriting. I do not think it will do as it stands. The crux of Woodward's concerns lay in the fiery and impetuous Silver's characteristic lack of restraint embodied in such gratuitously antagonistic assertions as, statistically, Mississippi has contributed nothing since World War II to the defense or even the running expenses of the national government. This statement, Woodward thought, seemed almost consciously calculated to bring down on your head every Korean gold star mother and every indignant taxpayer in Mississippi. And he warned that such excesses undermine the dignity and seriousness of your assault. The state legislature may be a snarling pack of jackals, he added, <laughs> but is this the place for that? When the book appeared, Woodward doubtless noted that while some of the specific passages he cited had been addressed, taken as a whole, the book was still more akin to a catalog of outrages than a carefully crafted piece of scholarship. Woodward's lofty standing in the profession <coughs> earned him an extended tenure as an unrivaled power broker and influence in historical practice <coughs> and beyond. His word carried enormous weight in decisions about who was hired and promoted, whose book was published, reviewed in the right places, and garnered major awards, not excluding the Phillips. Extraordinarily, as the stature he achieved within his own grudgingly chosen profession might be, the broader importance of Woodward's story lies in the insights it offers into the major developments and trends in American intellectual life and public affairs from the 1930s to the 1990s. At the outset of his career, his readiness to buck the established narrative of Southern history, setting apart from the overwhelming majority of the white historians who preceded him. Yet in his mind, it surely put him in the infinitely preferable company of William Faulkner, Thomas Wolfe, and Robert Penn Warren as part of the so-called Generation of 1900, a cadre of gifted and independent-minded Southern writers born primarily between 1800 and 1910. This literary cohort had emerged near the end of the 1920s as modernist challengers to what was, at heart, a tightly scripted Victorian vision of past and present, grounded in a conjoined mist of Old South gentility and New South progress. Woodward would step forward a decade later as a historian bent on doing much the same thing, and he readily acknowledged his profound indebtedness to Faulkner, Wolf, and Warren for illustrating the presence of the past in the present so vividly, and thus setting a standard to which he believed all historians should aspire. Meanwhile, Woodward's appreciation of the clarity and grace vital to an effective literary style became a hallmark of his own writing. Flannery O'Connor was hardly given to praising other Southern writers not named Faulkner, but after devouring the burden of Southern history, she reported to a friend that she had taken up reading C. Van Woodward, Southern history usually gives me a pain, but this man knows how to write English. <laughs> His dedication to clear and accessible writing served Woodward well as he joined Arthur Schlesinger and Richard Hosko in reinvigorating popular interest in history after World War II by harnessing it to new, more socially purposeful ends. In this regard, no aspect of Woodward's career looms larger than what it says about the importance of how historians perceive the very nature and purpose of their craft, particularly with respect to making their treatments of the past usable for their contemporary readers. As it did in the strange career of Jim Crow and his other scholarly writers, 
Woodward's, Woodward's ardor for reshaping history into a potential catalyst for change in the, in the present led him more than once to claim too much for the relatively slender share of supporting evidence at his disposal and even occasionally to distort it to better suit his purposes. It would take a while, but his willingness to allow what he saw as the needs of the present to color his interpretations of the past finally caught up with him. Succeeding generations of historians unearthed mounds of evidence running contrary to many of his interpretations and suggested that he had passed too lightly over the dark realities of historical context in his search for some more hopeful lesson applicable to his own day. Though Woodward was not about to admit it, many of the principal arguments offered in the four books he'd written in the first 20 years of his career and later credited with transforming the Southern history, you know, study of Southern history, had essentially been taken to the historiographical woodshed well before his death in 1999. Yet the critical scrutiny devoted to Woodward's historical monographs over the last half of the 20th century was, in a real sense, a tribute to the seminal importance of his contributions to scholarship during the first phase of his career. Indeed, the powerful and widespread impulse to test his arguments, evaluate his aims, methods, and assumptions, and follow up on the questions he raised was very nearly sufficient in and of itself <coughs> to dynamize the study of Southern history since the Civil War for the better part of two generations. Even so, Woodward's story is no thoroughly heroic and triumphal narrative from beginning to end. <coughs> Having invested through word and deed in the long battle for racial integration, he was sorely angered in the mid-1960s to see many younger blacks suddenly renouncing the aims and deliberately <coughs> even undermining the hard-won achievements of the civil rights movement while embracing the ideal of black separatism. This anger in turn fueled his steadfast opposition to separate black studies programs, even as he saw multiculturalism and its various outcroppings running directly counter to America's historic commitment to e pluralist union. Woodward's steadfast late career resistance to such developments arising on the left led some to stereotype him as yet another young liberal firebrand whose views shifted markedly to the right as he grew older. In reality, though, his fundamental stance on race, race relations, and cultural assimilation had remained remarkably consistent throughout his adult life. Beginning in the 1960s, what he saw on campus and beyond <coughs> amounted to an outright rejection of some of his most deeply felt beliefs. His bitterness at this disillusioned turn of events mounted in the face of the sustained emotional pounding he suffered between 1969 <coughs> and 1982, when he lost his only child, his three closest friends, and his wife. <coughs> Sadder still, perhaps, the timing of these severe personal losses prevented him from savoring some of his greatest personal triumphs. The satisfaction of being chosen to lead both the Organization of American Historians and the American Historical Association in the same year did nothing to dispel the anguish of watching his 24-year-old son Peter suffer the final ravages of the metastatic melanoma that would claim his life in September 1969. When he learned in April 1982 that he had received the Pulitzer Prize for his revised edition of the Civil War Diaries of Mary Boykin Chestnut, his wife, Lynn, was in the final weeks of her own struggle with cancer. He generally managed to keep his enduring grief over the personal losses he suffered at bay by committing himself to a work regimen more befitting an anxious assistant professor coming up for tenure. He was less successful in bottling up his anger over the direction of his profession and higher education in general, and his frustration at being able to do much about it. His bruised ego got the better of him in his over-the-top campaigns to prevent historian and high-profile Communist Party spokesman Herbert Atbecker from, from teaching a single one-semester undergraduate seminar at Yale. Meanwhile, his righteous anger is what he saw as a tidal wave of political correctness engulfing uh, college campuses also seemed to blur his judgment, as it did in his largely uncritical endorsement of right-wing provocateur Dinesh D'Souza's sensationalized account of multiculturalism run amok in American universities in 1991. 
Still, indications that such lapses in judgment, discretion, and self-control as marked the final decades of his long life had significantly blemished his re reputation or diminished his standing were not readily detected. His appearances at meetings of the Southern Historical Association still brought something of a hush over the proceedings, and on the very last of those visits, in November 1998, those proceedings featured a celebration of his 90th birthday. When Woodward died scarcely a year later, in December 1999, the torrent of superlatives unloosed in eulogies, obituaries, and tributes from former students as well as many who knew him only through his writing marked the passing of a figure of monumental importance. The most meaningful and certainly the most moving tribute Woodward received, however, came two, more, two months before his death in a remarkable letter from Arthur Schlesinger. Knowing that Woodward had already spent several months in the hospital struggling to recover from major heart surgery and sensing <coughs> this might be his last chance to pay homage to his friend of four decades, Schlesinger offered what amounted to a pre-mortem eulogy and one surely as fitting and elegant as delivered, any delivered upon Woodward's actual passing. As I contemplate your life, he wrote, I hope you will realize how much you have meant to the historical profession. Your preeminence derives partly from the superb quality of your, <coughs> of your <laughs> historical writing, but it derives uh, as much from your human presence. Not only had Woodward led the way in upholding the standards of the historian's craft against the nostrums of the passing day, but to Schlesinger's mind, he had rendered even greater service as the conscience of our profession and a vital source of moral leadership, which he added, you have provided unassumingly, effectively, and courageously, and you can inspire younger scholars to do their resolute best to grapple with a mysterious past. Though Woodward's zeal for forging that past into an instrument of change in the present had occasionally tested his fidelity to the standards of the historian's craft, Schlesinger was hardly overstating the case and stressing the importance of his transformative approach to that craft and awakening several decades worth of younger scholars to the exhilarating prospect of drawing on their training skills and instincts as interpreters of the past to make a real difference in the here and now. Thanks. Okay, now, now, now's the, now's the fun. Now it's the fun. Questions? <clears throat> well, I've got several more pages here for you. <laughs> <laughs> Plus, I brought some of the draft of my autobiography. <laughs> when I'm struggling to get out of third grade, it's pretty, pretty, pretty. <laughs> Rich. Uh, personal encounters with him? With Woodward? Yeah. Uh, I had a number of them, and... Uh, <coughs> I'm, but, but they kind of went down like this. Uh, I met C. Van Woodward about a dozen times. I mean, and I introduced myself to him about a dozen times. And it, it never registered. He, he, you know, he never let it register with me that, that, that he knew who I was. Uh, and uh, um, uh, which is, you know, uh, no, I'm not saying, you know, that should have necessarily, although by the end of his career, I'd written two articles critical of his work, and maybe that was why I had to do <laughs> uh, why I had to reintroduce him. But uh, he was being around Woodward, I'm gonna tell you, it was, uh, I've got this in the book when, when I'm talking about like when he came to a historical meeting. I mean, there would, it would be just a damn flood of people, just they, they would trample you. I mean, it was worse than a damn soccer brawl. The, the, the trying to get up there close to Woodward and slapping him on the back and, and calling him Van. Van, it's so good to see you. And of course, he looks, he's looking at him like, who in the hell is you? <laughs> and, and I just made made up my mind pretty early on that I was never going to be one of those people. You know? uh, so, uh, I mean, I, I respected his privacy. And he was always very polite. And we, you know, we, we exchanged conversation, discussion, but, but, uh, you know, I never, uh, you know, I never really felt as though, you know, he, he and I were sort of 
on the same plane in terms of just that, um, or, or his acknowledging that you know I, I worked in Southern District. But, uh, yes, sir. Am I right in remembering that Jimmy Carter quoted the irony of Southern history when he was running for president? And yeah, it, yes, he did. Would you comment some on that essay? I think it's oh, a great yeah. essay. That's one of the most, uh, maybe, I think, maybe his single most brilliant essay, The Irony of Southern History. Uh, and the irony of the irony of Southern History, you can't get away from irony in, in C. Van Wilkerson. He was a master ironist. He was Lieber. You know, he was he was a big disciple of Bieber. But the uh, uh, the irony of Southern history was uh, uh, it was his presidential address uh, uh, delivered uh, to the Southern Historical Association in 1952, and uh, Woodward was uh, you know Woodward was the uh, the legend of how bad a speaker Woodward was does not do him justice. <laughs> he was worse than that. He, um, his, uh, one of my favorite letters to his, his, his advisor, Howard Beale, said, uh, uh, now you got to remember, uh, you know, uh, he was, Woodward was going to teach it. He, he taught briefly at, at uh, Scripps College in California, mm -hmm. which was a women's school, and uh, you know, small classes, small school, he was, you know, you got to be Remember, your students are not going to know as much as you did. you got to be careful of that. But he said the main thing is, please do, even now, go out behind the barn and practice speaking so that you don't sound like your mouth is full of mush. <laughs> and uh, so Woodward gives this brilliant address in 1952, but completely overshadowed because the, uh, the, at the last minute, the hotels in Knoxville refused to serve uh, black members of the, of the association at a banquet, okay. at the presidential banquet. So uh, Woodward's cohort, not, not Woodward, who was not much of an organization man either, uh, they found they, they wound up trucking the whole crew out to this resort north of Knoxville. And he got up and gave a speech, and of course everybody was kind of looking around, looking at, look at that musty old moose head on the... Uh, <laughs> on the wall and stuff like that and they were paying attention to it. But the irony of Southern history, it was it was just so uh, uh, what he basically meant was that the the, the 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 whole view, you know, the nation's view of the South was that it stood apart from the rest of the country because and uh, and you know it, it had this history of of cruelty of Failure of defeat, of poverty, and uh, uh, it, you know, and, and that that just didn't fit with the broader American narrative of, of you know, success, affluence, <coughs> invincibility. So, uh, so Weber says, but the thing is, when you look at the world, you look at it globally. It's not the South that stands apart; it's the rest. Of America, because all those Europeans, you know, the nations have had, you know, they hell, they 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 bear grudges much older than the Southerners do about the Civil War, you know, and they they've been to it, they've had their countries occupied again and again, and uh, seen, you know, seen their their national economies devastated, and and so uh, and so what he was uh, what he was really saying was, and, and this uh, this came out in 1950, it was published. And only when it was published did people could and people could read it did they understand you know what what a brilliant contribution it was. But uh, you see, it came out there in the heat of the Cold War, and so he's he's saying, you know, this the uh, you know they they really ought to be listening to Southern historians, uh, uh, you know, when the, when they're, they're they're thinking about you know what can America, uh, you know. Uh, you know, America's role. What what can America achieve globally, and and uh, uh, you know how can we remake the globe in our own image? Uh, because you know Southerners had had experience with things like Reconstruction, and uh, and they you know they knew that, that uh, you know laudable ideals were not, were not always borne out in practical results, and uh, uh, so 
it was, uh, and, and, he, and, he, and he sort of making this, he, he, he went on in another essay several years later um, um, called uh, The Central Theme of Southern History to say that, that really the, the, it, it was not, it was not, you know, the, the Southern way of life to borrow. I knew I was going to wind up plugging his book somehow. Uh, the, uh, uh, you know, which was, yeah, it was, that was synonymous as Walker Percy said in New Orleans, uh, the Southern way of life means let's get, let's keep McDonald number six segregated. Uh, but it, it basically was segregation. White supremacy was the Southern way of life. And uh, the women were saying, well, you know, the real defining quality of the South is, is, its, is its past the uniqueness of its past within the nation that um, and Southerners should should you know be willing to sort of ground themselves in their sense of of their their uniqueness as a people in that in that past instead of continuing to fight just a futile struggle to maintain white supremacy which which by the you know by nineteen fifty eight was clearly on its last leg. So uh, but it was sort of, it was sort of of a piece. It was related to the strange career of Jim Crow, in a way, because he and the strange career of Jim Crow is saying, well, segregation is not old enough to be uh, really endemic to the Southern way of life. So uh, you know, he was he was he was trying to go at all angles on on this to get Southerners from thinking that you know they wouldn't be Southerners anymore if if they kind of gave up on trying to keep blacks down and. Um, you know, accepted integration. Yes? Oh, yeah, did, should we bring in a painting couch for you? Not funny. <laughs> Somehow um, I knew you were going to say that. Congrats. I'm so glad you're here. Um, and I can't wait to read the book, but I'll do that when I'm stronger. Um, I came in late, so I hope you didn't talk about this already, but I was always interested in his um, perspective on on um, Mary Chestnut and yeah. his, and I, I can't remember, there was some controversy I remember about his book about her, or I don't know, anyway, you yeah. talk about it, him and her and yeah. that. Well, he, um, he, it was a, it was a blessing for him in many ways, because, uh, uh, he retired. In, uh, he reached Yale's mandatory retirement age in 1977, and he had. He was kind of, you know, he was he was sort of finally becoming yesterday's news at, at Yale. Uh, uh, David Brian Davis had come into the history department and seemed to be attracting most of the of the bright new graduate students. And uh, of course, you don't have very many dumb new graduate students at Yale, so, <laughs> but uh, uh, but so this this project. They, they, you know, the, the people at the South Carolina Library at the University of South Carolina had, had been sort of uh, go-betweens go with him and the Chestnut family um, uh, to see if Woodward would agree to, to bringing out Chestnut's diaries. And, and uh, uh, a lot of you, uh, uh, you know, some of you may have read it or had it assigned. It was, uh, it, it was basically the most commonly read Civil War diary uh, uh, you know, like as a classroom assignment or, or as a teaching aid, you know, because I mean, she was, uh, you know, Chestnut was a, a you know, serving wit and, uh, and keen observer, and, uh, you know, so she was, her, her passages you know, really resonated with a lot of people. But as it turned out, they had discovered that there was more than one version of that diary. And so Woodward undertook to combine elements of several versions of that diary uh, into this new uh, edition. And uh, but the problem was, I mean, what, what the what the people at South Carolina and everybody who's you know uh, everybody whose opinion he asked and some who's some whose opinion he didn't ask would try to tell him was you know what did you go come out with this new version that's going to be you know because she had written she'd gone back through it in the 70s and 80s uh, 
to uh, uh, <laughs> you know kind of rework it, and she gradually you know, the the more the the later the, her revisions were, the more uh, the diary became, uh, or the less critical the diary became of the South or slavery, and. Um, and so Woodward, uh, he he wouldn't he he wouldn't uh, just they, they said well you just need to like you need to have the original diary right here and then you need to have the, the new <coughs> original diary right here right 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 side no 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 so he he kind of left out a lot of stuff from the first diary I mean he he some of it he cited but 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 not all of it and it was sort of like some of what he did in the strange career of Jim Crow he he, he just sort of you know, he, he sort of like cut Mary Chestnut off at mid sentence, uh, and um, so so when it finally came out, uh, you know the the reviewers jumped on it right away, and and said, well, you know this is really not you know from a historian standpoint, this is not really all that useful because you 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 know you don't know now exactly uh, when she wrote this, and um, you know is this is is this uh, uh, you know, which one will we take to be authentic? You know, which which can, can we really now go go back and, and tell our students to read? You know, uh, something we know has been you know revised several times and, and toned down and, and uh, so uh, he 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 got he got from historians who reviewed it he got he got some pretty heavy flat. However, he. Uh, you know, I, it was one of those deals I mean, uh, that you know, Woodward had, had never won a Pulitzer Prize, and uh, he, um, it was, I, I, you know, I will always think I you know, don't have any, any, you know, any words, so many words, any, any verification of it, but uh, that uh, there were a lot of people who just thought, if not now, when? And, and the book, see, the book was not, I mean, it didn't really even qualify for the category it was it was awarded in because it was not an original piece of, of, of scholarship. But um, the, um, the the Pulitzer Committee was in the I uh, I will say this after figuring out how all this happened. I know a hell of a lot about how a prize uh, that I will never receive is awarded. <laughs> so I've got a, an alibi, you know. I've got a, this book doesn't want to fight, so I, I can tell you exactly why. It's just because it's a conspiracy. But, uh, but the, the Pulitzer Committees in those days, and I, had, I hadn't followed them you know, recently, but they were extremely incestuous. And, I mean, Woodward was on, Woodward was on, was on the Pulitzer jury, I bet, eight or ten times. And, and he... Uh, I mean, he was on the Pulitzer jury when his friend Richard Hostetter won the Pulitzer. He was on the committee that recommended it. When, when Woodward won it, his Yale colleague, John Morton Bloom, was on the committee. And, uh, you know, so there's a lot of inside baseball going on there uh, to make that happen. Now, uh, the... Uh, you know, I mean, you, you, you could make a pretty good case, and I, and I do, and I think I do in the book, uh, you know, that he still, you know, he, he, given what he had done overall to the histor for the historical profession and how much he had influenced writing and uh, writing about American history, and he had, Woodward, I, I didn't mention it, but he, he was, uh, he served for 44 years or something like that as the editor of the Oxford History of the United States. Where he read just manuscript after manuscript and rejected a bunch of them because uh, you know they were, they were good solid scholarship, but you know nobody but a historian would ever be inclined to try to wade through them. And 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 so he held his to his guns. And so after, in forty years, uh, only there there are only three volumes in the, in the series were published uh, under Woodward's editorship. But you know he. He, he, uh, he, anytime, anytime he read somebody's manuscript, I don't care who you were, <coughs> you, know, you got the goods. I mean, he he, uh, he he wasn't just blowing the, that off. I mean, he you know he would he would write page upon page upon page of comments. And so I sort of allowed. Well, you know, like maybe it is kind of a consolation prize, but uh, if anybody's going to get 
a consolation prize. He probably had as good a case for one as, as about anybody else I could think of. So. And truth be told, our news of New South should have won too as well. So. Yes, sir. Uh, is there a good like uh, compendium or collection of his sort of public affairs commentary that you could recommend? Like his non-academic stuff in New York Review of Books or his sort of essays aimed at a public audience? Is that collected anywhere? Well, uh, he was too smart to put them all in one volume. He, you know, he spread them around so you had to buy. Uh, uh, he has, he has, uh, uh, he has. Uh, he has a collection called The Future of the Past. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, he was going to, I mean, the big excitement was when he came to Yale. Maybe that was one reason why Yale was so hot to hire him, was that he was going to write, he was going to write the book on Reconstruction. You know, the Civil Rights Movement was, was just gearing up, and he was going to go back in there and he was going to tell us what really happened, what, what the story was with Reconstruction. And uh, so he started it, but he just ran out of gas real quickly. I mean, he uh, um, he went, uh, you know, he, he visited a few archives in the north, and then then he, by the time he was going to make some, he made he visited a few southern archives. But the uh, the notes, if you look at his notes, and they're not extensive notes from any of this, but the notes from the northern archives when he's just started were very copious and detailed. And then and then by the time he's 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 in Montgomery or somewhere. He's he's scrawling on index cards, and and he just he basically I think was just he didn't have it in him to to you know he was never he was never one for for fact gathering you know I mean uh, anyway and he had he had given you know he had given a gargantuan effort in uh, in, in doing the research for origins because it was. Uh, uh, Every time he thought he had, it, had it, he looked at all the archives, they were. This is after World War II, and every, you know, the new collections were just popping open all the time, and so you know, which, which of course drove his editors nuts. Uh, but uh, so um, anyway, and I have no exact idea how I got off on this, except that it, there is another. Um, <coughs> There's a collection, it, it, when it find, when the, the, the press that he was supposed to do the reconstruction book finally faced up the fact that he was never going to write it, they they switched it to a book of his essays and and, on, and basically on race it was called American Counterpoint. And uh, uh, so it's good on race, but the future of the past is, uh, is uh, kind of, the, I think, the best kind of general selection of his, of his more general writing. But, I mean, the Burden of Southern History has some of the stuff that he wrote, uh, like for Harper's and, uh, and, and what had. Uh, so it's interspersed with, with his scholarship. And Woodward, uh, Woodward uh, also, he, he gave, when he gave up writing historical monographs, he gave up footnotes, too. Uh, <laughs> the, and I'm with him 100%. <laughs> uh, he... Uh, he didn't even put footnotes in the strange career of Jim Crow. And so, you know, he would say something like, well, a, a North Carolina, a visitor to North Carolina said this, but, mm -hmm. you know, he wouldn't know, well, where the hell did he say it? <laughs> uh, so, uh, but, but he, he, he stopped using footnotes. So, so he, he, he really, unless he was publishing something mm -hmm. in the American Historical Association, uh, uh, American Historical Review or the Journal of American he just didn't bother with footnotes, and he wrote. But well, he wrote these you know, hellaciously good and compelling essays. I mean, he loved her. He wrote for the American Scholar, the <coughs> Virginia Quarterly Review, and places like that. Uh, yeah. uh, yes. And the way you started out describing this guy, it sounds like. Hunter S. Thompson, more so than a, <laughs> a, a historian. So, when did he finally get serious? I mean, was there a time when things changed? Well, he was uh, he was nothing if not full of himself, and, and you know he he was uh, and I, it's really kind of hard to. I mean, he was you know it was, it was very clear everywhere he went, people you know were kind of awestruck by him because he. he 
he was such a voracious reader, you know, he, could, he, he had a literary style, you know, uh, as a very, as a, as a college student in Arkansas that, that you know, would have been the envy of somebody in a creative writing, masters of, you know, creative writing class anywhere else. Uh, and so he got a lot of deference, and he, uh, he kind of stayed, he was immature um, in a lot of ways for, for a long time. Uh, when he went out to, uh, when he went out to Scripps College to teach, um, you know, his advisor said, now, you know, this is a small school, and, and you're going to find yourself being in a situation where you have to interact with your faculty colleagues more <laughs> than you would at a big, big university. And, you know, and, and, and you know, Woodward was not, you know, he was not particularly keen on that. And, he, uh, uh, and then he found out, he wrote, he wrote his advisor's first letter back to his advisor. Wrote, well, not only do we have all these faculty gatherings, but most of them are attended by students. <laughs> and, and he just sort of, you know, he just, you know, he, he made no bones about it ever. That, uh, you know, he just really didn't want to fool with teaching undergraduates. And he, uh, he worked, you know, he, he got it. Not for the time they went to Yale, he got, you know, maybe taught mm -hmm. at, you know, at most two two courses a year, and some years not that. And uh, and he quickly he kept pushing. He says, "Well, you know, we got to emphasize graduate education. You know, we're going to have to you know, sort of compartmentalize a little bit and you know, spread the you know sort of delegate here responsibility for teaching graduate students and undergraduates." And, and uh, you know, the department chair didn't need to ask if he had anybody in mind. Teach the the graduate students. He, he uh, uh, cause he, yeah, he certainly did. But but he was you know by the same token I mean you know he was uh, he he rode around he uh, oh he hung out with uh, uh, he was uh, he, he was involved in defending Angelo Herman who was a, a young black man who was a communist organizer in Atlanta uh, and uh, got he got arrested on this uh, Civil War era. For violating a Civil War era statute about inciting insurrection in in Atlanta in 1932, and so Woodward kind of you know, he jumped in there on the defense uh, to to Herman's defense, and then when he got to North Carolina, he you know he was instead of going to class, he was riding around with a communist labor organizer during the 1934 Texas strike, and uh, uh, which all of which finally he. Uh, yeah, and, and, and later on, uh, Woodward become quite a staunch anti-communist. Uh, and in fact, he, was, he, uh, he had been in naval intelligence during the war, and uh, they put him in for an uh, assignment to a, uh, to a kind of special task force for uh, uh, you know, to study the history of naval warfare or something. And uh, he couldn't get his security clearance because they went back and found all of these uh, uh, times that he, you know, when he was hanging out with communists and uh, when he was at Scripps College and World War II broke out, he had two, com two German colleagues who were immediately whisked away uh, and you know, thrown in the pokey for about a month and a half or something. And he just raised holy hell about that you know, in the newspapers on the campus and everywhere. And, and so all of that shows up. And I, I got his FBI and uh, all of that shows up. And he, he never could quite figure what he had done and why, why he didn't. Uh, uh, or he said he couldn't figure why he didn't get it. But I, I think he probably realized that you know, he, was, his, he, was, he, he was seeing shoulder to shoulder with too many uh, radical communists or whatever. And uh, so by, by the time. By the time this issue comes up with this guy out at Yale, you know, he's a you know, he's 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 pretty rabid. You know, he's he's warning guys he knows in SNCC that you know the communists are trying to infiltrate SNCC and you better watch. You can't, you can't trust them. And, you know, you say you're nonviolent, but the uh, communists might be nonviolent when it comes right down to it. So he was he was he was pretty rigid um, by the time he reached middle age um, on that.
Thank you, Jim. All right, thank you, guys. Any mic? Sound of Booker? No, I don't think I ever asked that.